Well, I get to give you two things. I get to give you a welcome and an apology. Firstly, the welcome. I can think of few better ways to end my Sunday than worshiping God with you in our beautiful tile and brick sanctuary. And now the apology, because unfortunately our beautiful brick and tile sanctuary is rather cold this evening. Um, It's rather unfortunate. Oh, Liz has still got her um, gloves on and her hat. Um, Yeah, it's not the right night for our heating to um, not be working. So we do pass on our apologies. To those who are joining us later listening by YouTube, of course, I only need to give you the welcome. Um, Your heating is your business. Um, But I can tell you, and I tell you this genuinely, that we've just had some beautiful, stunning, warm days here. And it's just so unfortunate that the clouds have gone low and tonight is particularly cold. But on this night, with this worship team, what a time to gather and to worship God.
I should say that the highlight of our morning service this morning was when our girls' brigade came and shared with us all their adventures from, um, from the camp that they'd been away on. And I'm chuffed to say that one of our dearly beloved girls' brigade is here again tonight, and she looks so happy and secure with a leader on either side. So it's lovely to have you. Let us pray. Lord God, in our many seasons of life, in hope and fear, in joy and in despair, you come into our midst. As we gather this evening, sharing our alleluias for death overcome, sharing our silence, as we hold our imaginations in common, you come into our midst. Assure us of your presence surrounding us and hold us with all that burdens us and all that we have to be thankful for. Help us to be with you and your risen Son here and now. Lord God, creator of the bluebells and the larks, sustainer of the stars and galaxies, redeemer of everything that has life and breath, we confess that we are far from perfect and we lack the subtle word of encouragement, the vision to be the solution to heart. We can, we can speak too much and rarely listen as we ought. We move when we should be still. And we know that we can come before you without focus. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us through the hands once stretched out on the cross. Forgive us through the hands held out for Thomas to touch. And receive the confessions of our hearts in this time of silence. In Jesus, we are offered hands, leading us into a future surrounded by his love. Receive his promise of forgiveness and be released from the burdens which bind us so that we may open the doors of our hearts and with confidence walk into the future surrounded by resurrection hope. And so we raise our prayers to the one who shares our wounds, who shares our lives, who shares in our past and present and future. And as we hear the sounds of life all around us, we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good evening. We have two readings tonight from the Scriptures, one from Ruth and the other from John 20. This morning, Graham gave an introduction to Ruth very quickly, and I was thinking about that, and one of the things I looked at, uh, just briefly, a commentary this afternoon by Alistair Begg, who introducing a list of readings for the month or so. And he said that about Ruth, it was ordinary people in the hands of an extraordinary God. And that's, I suppose that's what Graham hopes to reveal to us tonight. 
ordinary people in the hands of an extraordinary God. So we read Ruth chapter 1 and verses 1 to 14. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian, and they were Ephrites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married a Moabite woman, one named Orpha and the other, na- other Ruth. After they lived there about ten years, both Malin and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to aid these people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, and you have shown your, your dead unto me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of your other husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We'll go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have many more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you want to wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpha kissed her mother-in-law and said goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Now in John's Gospel, at chapter 20, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together, with doors locked for the fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks on his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. So what I want to do tonight is just to start a it could be a one-off series, it could be a series, it could be an occasional thing, of taking a whole book of the Bible, and particularly a book that we don't necessarily think about that often, and look at the whole book of the Bible in one evening. 
And of course, when we look in depth at passages of the Bible, as we do, there's a richness there. There's a great learning there. But I think there's also something to discover when we get to take in the whole narrative. And as we look at different types of books in the Bible, we get to see the richness of the literature that makes up our Bible. And so what I want to do tonight is to start with the wonderful book of Ruth. Let us pray. Lord God, help all of us listening to hear something of your goodness through the story of Ruth. May I speak faithfully, Lord, and help us to listen. And as I speak, may I decrease in people's presence, and may you, Lord God, increase. Amen. So let me say a few words by introduction to the book of Ruth. You'll notice in your Old Testament that the book of Ruth comes between the book of Judges and 1 Samuel, I think it is. And you'll also notice, as Andrew read, the first line of the book of Ruth, it says, in the time of Judges. And as I say, it's between the book of Judges and 1 Samuel. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the book of Ruth was actually written much later on. And it's almost written historically. And, and it was written at that time. There's a lot of evidence to suggest this. It was written at that time because the Israelites or the Jews were being particularly antagonistic towards the Moabs or the Moabites. There was a real dislike of the foreigner at that time. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this book of Ruth was written to encourage people not to think like that about foreigners, particularly the Moabs. But whatever the reason, whatever the background behind this book, what we're left with is one of the greatest short stories ever written. One of the greatest stories. So it's only four chapters. There's only three main characters. And remarkably for a book, every character is a good character. There are no bad characters in this book. And often when you have stories with only good characters, the, the story doesn't work. But the story of Ruth works wonderfully with this rather idyllic setting, with this rather bucolic setting, these, these, these good people. And as I take us through the book of Ruth, I hope that you can see something of God's goodness through the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth begins with a person called Elimelech, who is married to Naomi and lives in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem at that time, which means town of bread, so obviously harvest and things are a big part of life in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a small town. It's not a fortified city. It's not necessarily a particularly significant place. Bethlehem in Judah. And Naomi lives there with Elimelech, and they have two sons. But then famine comes to Bethlehem. And so Naomi and Elimelech decide that in order to look after their family, they need to become economic migrants. They're forced to leave to feed their family. And more than that, they have to go to the land of the hated Moabs. So they have to go to the land of the Moabites. So, so Naomi and Elimelech move to, to a Moabite place. And they plan, as it says in the Bible, that they're only going to be there a little while. But instead, um, they, they stay there a long time. And um, while they're there, what, sadly, Naomi loses Elimelech. Her husband passes away. Her two sons grow up and both marry local women. One of these women is called Orpah. And just as a little piece of trivia, Oprah Winfrey is named after Orpah. It's simply that as Oprah grew up, her relations got the R and the P mixed up and gradually she became Oprah rather than Orpah. And the other daughter-in-law is called Ruth. And they are both part of what were the hated Moabites. And then Naomi's life takes an even worse turn when she loses both her sons. Both her sons pass away. And so now it's just Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. And things get even worse, because now famine comes to Moab as well. 
And in this time, Naomi has heard that back home in Bethlehem, things are a bit better, and so now they can go there to be fed. But in the first of many acts in this book of someone putting others ahead of themselves, Naomi says to her daughters-in-law, look, look at the way God's treated me. God's forgotten me. Don't come back with me. Stay here with your own family. Don't stay with me. I'm old. I've had my time. You stay with your own family. Leave me alone. I'll go back myself. And in this story of good people, both her daughter-in-laws refuse to leave her. They say, no, we're not going to leave you. We love you. But Naomi persists. Leave me. Please leave me. You've got your own life to lead. It will be much better here. And eventually, her daughter-in-law Orpah is persuaded to leave. And there's much hugging and kissing and an emotional ending and Orpah stays and with her family. And now Naomi says to Ruth, Ruth, you have to leave me as well. You have to go back to your family. And that's roughly where Andrew's reading left us. Now, something I read, I, I learned from Robert Alter, um, who's, who's a Bible translator and a commentator, and I, I learn a lot about him about these Old Testament books. Something he says is it's very common in in biblical narratives, for the first time a character speaks, that we learn a lot about their character. So the first words we hear them say tells us a lot about their character. And now we have wonderful words of Ruth. After Naomi says to her, you have to leave me. And Ruth says to Naomi, don't ask me to leave you. For wherever you go, I go. Wherever you lodge, I lodge. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. For only death shall part us. And you can imagine for Naomi, those were quite wonderful, encouraging words to hear that her beloved daughter-in-law wasn't leaving her. Naomi had put her first and said, you go ahead, but Ruth had chosen to be with her. But you can imagine for Ruth, this is a huge sacrifice. She's a Moab. She's hated when she'll go back to Bethlehem. So she's going back as a hated foreigner. And when she says those words in Hebrew, wherever you lodge, I lodge, that means wherever we have to stay temporarily. Ruth's under no doubt about what kind of life and how hard life is ahead of them. And so... Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem. And what a stir there is in Bethlehem when they arrive. And the people see her and say, is that Naomi? Now, think back to when you've not seen someone for a long time, a long time. And then they say to you, how are things? And that's a great question to answer. It's a brilliant question to answer. If you can say something like, I don't know, like, well, there's 16, children, 16 grandchildren now. Eight of them so far have got into Oxford. Um, I managed to sell the business and retire early. We've got the place in France. Hold on a second, I'll put the roof back on the car. You know, that kind of thing. It's lovely if you can say that. But it's not lovely if life's treated you badly. And you think, oh, no, do I need to tell them. And Naomi is broken. And when they say, is that Naomi? She says, don't call me Naomi. Because Naomi means sweetness. Call me Mara. Because Mara means bitterness. And God has treated me bitterly. Do you see, she's lost her trust in God. God has treated me bitterly. And Bethlehem, as I say, is this town of bread. It's built around the harvest. And when they arrive back, it's the time of the barley harvest. So all hands are on deck. No one's in the town. Everyone's out in the fields or on the threshing floor as well. But of course, Naomi and Ruth don't have any land to harvest. And now we come to the first of two traditions or customs that the Israelites have and that make a big effect on this story. And the first custom is one that still happens for a lot of people in Israel now. A lot of people in Israel still do this. And the custom is that when you harvest land, it's fine to harvest land efficiently, efficiently and well, but you're not to go back and double-check your land and make sure you've harvested everything. 
You have to leave it. And you have to allow the poor and the immigrants and those without land to take something from it. That was a tradition then, and it's still a tradition for many Jews now. And so Naomi says to Ruth, look, we have this tradition here where you can go out in the land, and even if it's not your land, you can just follow and see if there's anything left. And she says, and do you know what? I've got a distant relation here. Why don't you go to his land and maybe harvest there? And so that's what Ruth does. Ruth goes out to the harvest. And so we have this wonderful harvest scene in Bethlehem. We have the dust and the gathering and the energy of the whole town out harvesting and gathering and reaping and all these things. And then far back in the field, there are the poor and the immigrants just finding whatever they can find to eat. And one of these people is Ruth. And now enters the story, this distant relation of Naomi called Boaz. And as I said, it's a very idyllic scene. It's a very idyllic story. And Boaz comes to the scene. He's the owner of this land. And he greets his workers, those who are work, working, and he says, the Lord bless you. And they reply, the Lord bless you as well. It's this kind of wonderful setting. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you as well. And Boaz says to one of his overseers, one of the lads who are looking after the work, says, who's that, Tim? Who's that lady at the back there? And they say, well, that's the Moabite. That's the foreigner who came with, back with Naomi. She asked me first thing this morning whether I minded whether she was able just to hang around at the back and pick up whatever's left over. And I said, no problem. And to give her a due, she was there first thing this morning. She's worked hard all day. And only now is she briefly sheltering from the sun. And Boaz comes up to Ruth and he speaks to her. And he says to her, you can harvest here whenever you like. And there's some pitchers of water over there as well. You help yourself. Now, I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago, we spoke about the impact of acts of kindness. How when we carry out acts of kindness, the impact of those can go far beyond what we expect. And this act of kindness by Boaz seems to have a huge effect on Ruth who's gone through so many bad things until this point. And she says to Boaz, she says, how can you be so kind to someone like me who's just a foreigner? And Boaz gives even more. He says, I heard, I heard what you did after your husband died. People tell us. I heard how you've treated your mother-in-law. Come now here, come and have some lunch. Come and dip your crust in this vinegar. And then tomorrow when you come back and harvest, don't be at the back and just pick up what's left over. Come and harvest at the front and take as much as you want. That first day when Ruth goes home and Naomi's waiting for her nervously and she says, Ruth, how, how was your day? And Ruth says, and she explains all these things. And not only that, she's brought back some of the lunch that Boaz had given her to share with Naomi. And Naomi starts praising God again and says, now, I, I now know that the Lord gives me life rather than punishing me. So this act of kindness has led now to Naomi again receiving her faith and again trusting in God. And the harvest continues. The rest of the season of the harvest continues and, and Ruth goes out every day and harvests until the end of the harvest. And as you'd expect in a place like this, there's a huge party at the end of the harvest. And Naomi says to Ruth, and here's where a little romance begins to come into things. Naomi says to Ruth, you know, we have another tradition here. We have a tradition of marriage. You see, I inherited some land here, but it was after your father-in-law, and after my son's passed away. And I was destitute, so I had to sell it. But we have a tradition of marriage here, that a close, if a close relation marries you, then you can buy back or redeem the land. And you know, Boaz is a, a relation of ours. And so Ruth goes to the party at the end of the harvest, and she says to Boaz, she says, Boaz, if you, if you marry me, then my mother-in-law, Naomi, will no longer be destitute. And Boaz says, look, I thought you were kind already. I thought you were kind from the way that you treated your mother-in-law. 
But for a wonderful woman like you to want to marry someone like me, that is even kinder. Of course I would marry you, says Boaz. Of course I would marry you. But here comes another example of someone putting another person ahead of themselves and just trusting in God. Boaz says, I will marry you, but there's an even closer relationship of yours, even closer relation of yours in this town as well. And so it's only right and proper that we see if he would like to marry you. But if he doesn't want to marry you, I'll marry you. And so Ruth goes home and tells Naomi what has happened, and then they wait nervously, you'd imagine, to find out what happens. The next day, Boaz goes into town, and he goes to the town square, and sure enough, his kinsman, this relation, comes along to, um, and he gathers and says, can I have a meeting with you? And Boaz gathers some of the elders from the town as well, and sits down this kinsman and explains the situation, that Naomi has inherited some land, and that if you, and it's as the closest relation, you can buy back that land. And the kinsman says, brilliant, I'm going to do it. And then Boaz says, but there's something else. You also have to marry our daughter-in-law, and she's a Moabite. And you just wonder how much Boaz here is rather hoping he says no. And sure enough, the, the man says, I, I can't do that. I can't marry the foreigner. It, it will spoil my estate. You'll have to do it, Boaz. And so Boaz, in front of all these witnesses in the town square, says, you've heard this. You've heard what's happened. Okay, I'll marry her. And it sounds like, and it sounds like these, these people are so fond of Boaz and so pleased for him that they say to him, the Lord bless you. The Lord bless you in your marriage. And so Ruth and Boaz get married and they have a son. And the story of Ruth ends with a lovely scene where Naomi, who had so little and lost so much, gathers up her grandson and takes him out, sits him on his, her knee and nurses him. And the townspeople are blessing her. May God bless you. The townspeople bless her in this wonderful, happy scene. And I think there's so much we can learn from the book of Ruth. We can learn about the importance of acts of kindness. We can learn as see the warning about how we treat foreigners or how we think about others. We can see in it examples of putting our others before ourselves and trusting in God. But I think there's even an even richer message. I think there's a message that what happens in our life, whether we have children or not, whether we're married or not, all these things, great blessing as they are, aren't what ultimately will matter. Because our real life, our true life, will be in heaven, will be eternally with God. And what matters now, most of all, I think, is how we are part of God's plan here. How we can use our lives to point others towards God. That's not the final mention of Ruth in the Bible. If you go to the very first page of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, and then you go to verse 5, and you'll see there the family tree of Jesus Christ. And in the family tree of Jesus Christ, you'll see the name of Ruth. Ruth, who was the grandmother, the great-grandmother of David. That small town, Bethlehem, would now be known as the city of David. And Ruth, and Ruth's life, this wonderful lady who put others before herself, who trusted in God, she was always part of God's plan. Amen.
J.K. Rowling, as you probably notice, is quite a lot in the news at the moment, the author of the Harry Potter novels. And whatever we know about J.K. Rowling, she's brilliant at engaging with her fans, particularly on Twitter. And a lot of our young fans write to her. And there was one young fan who wrote to her saying that she was having a really hard time at school. And J.K. Rowling, and I can't quite remember exactly, but she said something really powerful. She said, you know, being a teenager, people think that's the time to rebel. But it's not, you know. That's the time when you have to conform. You have to conform to the way people will expect you to dress, the trainers you wear, the music you like. It's really hard to be different as a teenager. And in our prayers for others now, we're going to particularly pray for the schools as they start this week. We'll pray for our pupils of this whole region, and we'll also pray for the teachers and support staff as well. Let us pray. Lord God, as our schools have started again, we offer our prayers now for the term that remains. We pray for our closest school at Langley, but for all the schools in Gallish Hills and in this region. God bless our young people. Please, Lord, watch over them. Watch over those who are not looking forward to tomorrow. Watch over those who don't see the value in being at school. We pray for them, God. We ask that you bless them. We ask that they know how precious they are, how loved they are. We ask, Lord, for your blessing on all those who feel lonely at school or picked on. Please, Lord, be with them. Just like you showed Naomi hope, please show them moments of hope. Remind them of your goodness and that you are with them always. We pray, Lord, for all those who are here tonight and listening, who work in schools. We ask your blessing on them. Any who are struggling, those who are tired, those who need inspiration, And when we go past schools this week, Lord, help us to remember all those there and to pray for them. And now, Lord, in the quiet of this night, hear our own prayers. Help us, Lord, to go where you call us and to put our trust in you. And so be with those we have prayed for and be with us in the week ahead. Amen. And so let us go from here with a peace that passes understanding. And may the blessing of God the Father Son and Holy Spirit, be with us and all those we love this evening and always. Amen.